it's so interesting. I, I'm like so fascinated for me too to understand. There's no light at the end of the tunnel. When does this stop? What am I without this? I don't know. Welcome back to Off the Cuff. I am joined by actress and mental health advocate, Alessandra Corisani. I really how appreciate the way that you say my name because Italians really just know how to give it that extra 10%. It's one of those things to being like Italian American. You have to say most things like an asshole. <laughs> A bruschetta. <laughs> you have to say it like an asshole. People sometimes have, I've been in an interview one time when someone truly thought my last name was Tortellini and oh, I went with man. it because I was like, that's kind of chic. I'm into it. Well, borderline like, you know. Borderline insulting, cool. yeah. but also, yeah. you know, my favorite pasta dish. So yeah. Yeah, can't too. complain. So, you know, it, there's nothing wrong with getting named after pasta. Yeah, exactly. Um, <laughs> so if you guys are familiar with Alessandra, you are crazy, but Alessandra's been on. <laughs> Malcolm in the Middle, Big Bang Theory, mm -hmm. just to name a couple. Uh, she is a huge mental health Ooh, advocate. I like that too, um, yes. Emotional support, which we're going to talk about. My first question that I want to have is, how are you feeling today? I love that question. Thank you so much for asking yes. that. I'm feeling good because I'm here with you. I've already had quite the ridiculous email assholes from the morning, but to be expected on a midday situation. So there you go. But I'm happy to be here with you and get some laughs. What do you hate more email or when somebody calls you on the phone? I love a phone call. I will oh, wow. pick up. We are completely opposite. Yeah. I will pick I up anyone's phone call. Every time I get a phone call. Really? There's oh, a lot of issues there that we have to talk about. Like, oh, really? For sure. Wow. Anytime my phone rings, I think I'm in trouble. Oh, my gosh. No, for yeah. me, I am very disorganized in the sense where if I read an email, I'll probably forget about it. So for me, emails and texts are the worst. If I don't respond right away, it's gone. Like, say yeah. goodbye to that email. You'll never hear from me again. I've always wondered, just to get into, like, the mental health yeah. scope a little bit, I always wondered if, like, so I'm bipolar type 2. Okay, cool. Fun. I'm bipolar okay. part 1. All right. So then we could we could form, like, Dragon can, Ball Z. That's and, like, right. Make a super, a super that's bipolar right. person. That's right. We could. That's, we could. That's what it is. That's right. So I always do. wondered how much of, like, my bipolar makes me, like, afraid to answer texts and phone calls. Oh, interesting. Like, a kind of, like, a fear that you have? Yeah. Did because, you like, have they, that as a kid? Yes, because I was like kind of a knucklehead though. Like yeah. I knew I was kind of in trouble. But I've always kind of wondered like 30 years from now when they study like social media and the mental health space. Right. Like how much of it like contributes to like actually what we deal with on an everyday basis. And I think it contributes to everything. Like honestly, oh, I think social media is completely behind 99.9% .9 of it, you know? Yeah, it magnifies like everything. I mean, I had some asshole that, that sorry, can I swear on this? Like I'm assuming yeah, so you like- curse all the great. Oh, good. Okay, good. Right. So that's- I don't give a <laughs> you say, all right? <laughs> I, I had some- Bang Yeah, theory. that's right. Times. Okay, I got you, you know, <laughs> but I will say like, I have people who are just so rude on social media for no reason. And this morning, someone went as far as not only being rude on the Twitter, like to me, like and tweeting me like really awful things about my mental health. Love then that you they, called it the Twitter. The Twitter. Yeah, because I'm calling it the Twitter. But on top of that, then they went out of their way to find my podcast, my emotional support podcast website to find the contact to then email the contact form that's like a submission form to let me know how pathetic I am as a human being. And I was like, it's 8 a.m. Take it easy. I guess my whole point and my rant for saying this is that for me, I'm used to kind of that rejection and that kind of like asshole remark because that's what yeah. comes with the territory of being an actress and being, you know, someone that's on a platform. But when you are dealing with mental health on top of it and someone's like picking on you because of that and bullying because of that, it's really tough and, and feel like these kinds of things need to be stopped because you're doing this to people who may not know how to deal with rejection and know, know how to deal with this. And that's what causes this spiral effect of suicides and all of these awful things that happen. For and sure. there's no monitoring. There's no Twitter police. It's crazy. No, there's not. You know, I wanted to touch on too, you talked about uh, rejection, obviously in your profession. So you've been acting since you were a child. Yes, yes, since okay. I was like nine. 
So since you were like nine, was rejection easier at nine as it is now? That's interesting. I never thought of that. I'll say this. I think that, that I've been up a kid's mental space. Oh, totally. I think I've been. No, we don't want you, kid. No. Yeah. Sorry. No. Ugh. Well, I'll tell you, I think that I got a really tough kind of tough mug. Like I'm really tough about things because I was actually a competition dancer. And so oh, okay. I did dance competition since I was like four years old. For me, that was so much harder because you're performing live competing against hundreds of people in one time and like a Saturday and like I did this every single weekend. So for me, the acting thing, yes, it was like personal, but you wouldn't hear from the audition for weeks on end that you didn't get it or that you did get it, you know? So oh. it kind of gave you more space where I feel like I had the like yeah, really yeah. tough stuff that happened to me when I was really young, but I loved doing it. And I was the one, my parents did not force me to be in the business. They did not force me to be a dancer. Like none of that. I was like, I need to do this. I need to do this. This is my life. Like I want to be on a stage. I want to perform. So they just yeah, followed it, what it, I wanted. It came to you pretty naturally. Exactly. Like it was not, so, I didn't have a stage mom. <laughs> that's pretty high octane for four years old though. I think I was still in a diaper at four. Yeah, I mean, maybe, possibly, but I was, I was very full. Now, so I was a perfectionist and like had so much energy. They had to do something with me. Like, and I was an only child. So I was just bouncing off the wall alone. Give me all that attention. Yeah. Yeah. I want it all, all. Away from the jump. And I you want know, a trophy. I was like that. And you got a trophy to prove it. Yeah. See, do you still dance now? I do. Yeah, I do. Yeah, not competition, so like, but for my own mental yeah. health, that's the one thing that kind of is like my form of meditation. Yeah. So, like, what's a what's a day in the life of a working actress? Right Going now? to Home Goods on a on a morning? No, I'm kidding. Yeah, love Home Goods though. Love Home Goods. Wish I was sponsored by them. What is a day in a life? It's very different than it was two years ago because it used to be, you know, you would get in your car, you go to your acting coach, you'd go to your auditions. You know, you'd go to your meetings, you know, and all this stuff. And now everything's in your home. So it's very different. I used to have a recording studio and now I record in my house, as do you. Like this is, yes. it's just a, it's a new normal. I record, you know, when I have any time I have an audition or a meeting or a Zoom, it's in this office. This is where, I, this is where the magic happens. So, so you have to get in the character in that place? Yeah. Yeah. You just like walk around your apartment just like, all right, here we go. Yeah, just like pacing and like my husband's like, I'm like, it's time. Like, let's go put me on tape right now, you know? That's super odd, but also super cool at the same time. It's super odd. I'll tell you that much. Yeah, it's like it's super odd. And it's I'm like, so, hey, honey, I'm going to pretend to be somebody else. Film me yeah, right now. Yes, pretty much. Yeah. And then that's like a he projects louder into the camera and I'm like, the audition's not about you. It's about me. Like. And he's like, what do you want from me? You know, I don't know. Course, but I'm so sure supportive. he's just like, I can't do this. Some days. <laughs> he's like, can we get back to normal life? Like when you used to go yeah. to an audition? Yeah. So hopefully that happens soon. Let's get into that too. A thing that doesn't really get spoken about a lot is a lot of stuff that gets spoken about is what we go through. Right. But it's also, we forget about to talk about like what our partners go through. Oh yeah. Yeah. So I'm engaged and I already know like. Thank you so much. She's awesome. She's beautiful. Aww. She's great. But I know I'm a pain in the ass. Yeah. I wasn't diagnosed until 2019. Uh-huh. Wow. Interesting. So, long story short, I was having horrible anxiety and panic attacks for like a month. I wasn't eating. I lost like 40 pounds. Um, wow. I couldn't shower on my own. I was afraid to go to the bathroom. Yeah. I went to the ER 15 nights in a row yeah. just thinking there was something Panic, wrong in my yeah. body. I've told this story on the show. Because it said, feels like a stroke, that. right? Like it feels like you're like, am I having a heart attack or something? Yeah. Everything. I was yeah. like, I have cancer. I yeah. have my heart valve doesn't work. I'm going to explode. I'm yeah. going to have a stroke. I'm going to have a seizure. And I told myself one day, I said, you know what? I'm going to fucking kill myself, man. I can't yeah. do this shit anymore. Like, this is a horrible, horrible existence. Right. So then I said, all right, let me try one thing. Before we go crazy to that, yeah. to that extent, yeah. you know, uh, d let's go and see a mental health professional. Right. So every time I was going to the ER, I was seeing heart doctors and, uh, you know, getting my brain scanned. Right. But, you know, like physical, general of physicians. Yeah. I said, Listen, let me go inpatient somewhere for a little bit and let's figure this out. Mm. I went inpatient for four days, three nights. 
And they really set me up with a foundation, a circle of people to go see mental health professionals. And you were open to that. You were open to hearing like what was because you were kind of at your last resort, right? Yeah, I was I was like, listen, if you guys like want to like shoot me in the space for like experimental medicine, I'll do it. Just make me feel better. And I said, listen, I just need to find out what's going on. And a lot of that was uh, I was drinking a lot at the time. I was partying a lot at the time. Just wasn't taking care of myself. Mm. And uh, I ended up there for, um, and when I got out, that's when I started going to therapy. You know, um, I got a medication uh, routine. Mm -hmm. So they diagnosed you in the hospital with bipolar disorder? No. So they diagnosed me with pan, like they they said, you're having anxiety disorder. Right. Right. Sure. Like they they were like, you have GAD. You're just like going through this. Because when I got in there, I was like, oh shit, I think I made a mistake. Well, you know okay. what I mean? Because uh, yeah, like I got to eat this food for four days. Like, yeah, yeah. And I'm not this crazy. My was a... <laughs> and then my, my roommate was a paranoid schizophrenic. Yeah. And you're like, hello, that's not me. Yeah. And, and I would, he would be screaming. <laughs> he would be screaming every night that I stole his clothes. Yeah. Well, maybe you, you did. I fucking knew that I stole my clothes. <laughs> when I got out, I started going to therapy and I got a, you know, an, an a evaluation. Profession. Yeah. Oh, yeah, yeah. yeah. So they did all that, and um, I was prescribed Lexapro. Uh-huh. I was prescribed one antidepressant before that, and sure. it like, didn't work. It made me a monster. Yeah, that's what happened to me. Yeah. Makes your highs higher and your too. lows lower. Yeah. Yeah, so like my low was like super low. Yeah. yeah. And, and I said, this is supposed to help me. But it's and interesting it's because I don't know one of my co-hosts who comes on and does a regular like kind of bit on our show. He lives with bipolar disorder, too. It's very interesting to me. And we laugh about it all the time because even though we both live with bipolar disorder, they're so very different. So things oh, that you're it's telling me, it's different. so it's so interesting. I, I'm like so fascinated by this because it's, it's a learning experience for me, too, to understand. Uh, Selexa was the name Selexa, of it. Selexa. Yes. Right, right, right. Selexa and my body just did not react it to it was like select so Danny, well so this is not your friend <laughs> it was just not my friend and then i remember too it's like hey uh the doctor telling me like about the side effects and i was just being like yeah he was like well it could cause like suicidal thoughts and cool. i said oh i said all right i'll take uh the plunge and try it yeah and then that that also caused like another part of me to feel like this is never going to get better because i'm taking this pill right. to help me and it didn't work and i'm still having panic that attacks. is what we talk about on the show all the time is that you're hopeless you would give up because you're like i'm literally doing everything that i possibly can and nothing yeah. there's no light at the end of the tunnel when does this stop and every time i'm like oh, listen i'm take, i'm doing what they're telling me to do and it's not fucking working yeah i i don't know what i'm going to do and then I didn't know that there were other antidepressants. I, I just thought that like they were just like one, one and done. Here you go, right, right? Yeah, one and done. And they were like, "All right, we're gonna try another one." Then I tried Lexapro, and I've said this like a hundred times. Like, listen, I'm not a mental health professional, but I am an advocate for medication. At least trying it when you have a diagnosis. Lexapro like saved my life. In the time when I started taking it, I was like, "Wow!" Like, because I think with with What's mental the proper health, proper cocktail for you, you know. Yes, there's no the right fit for everyone. For and I'm sure that you can attest to this, too. It's it's hard after a diagnosis because we always say we want to get back to like the old me. Right. Yeah, right. Like the old right. Danny, uh, the old Alessandra. But like, what is the okay old to be, me? Yeah. What is the old? Yeah. You know, yeah. it's it, we're setting ourselves up for failure with that kind of thought process. Absolutely. Because we also don't even and I don't know if you were oh, oh, like like this when you were younger, but there are moments that I had flare ups of the bipolar disorder that I didn't know because I wasn't diagnosed till I was 22 years old. For me, you know, now looking back at it, there were so many signs, but my mom was at such a loss, like she didn't know what to do, but she would put me in therapy. She put me in hypnotherapy. She tried all these different types of modalities, but not understanding what the problem was, you know, and no right. one knew what the problem was. And when I was 15, I was put on antidepressants, which was the worst thing that you could do for someone with my disorder because it made my highs higher and my lows lower, which caused me yes. to be suicidal, to have attempts, to have these ideations all the time, the things that I never had. So when you go like, I want to go back to normal, what is normal? You know, I say this all the time to my husband because he's only known me as someone who's been properly medicated and feeling healthy 
you know, and feeling right. like thriving as my best self. And right. so what am I without this? I don't know. You know, explain to him when you're having a, an episode, do you know when your episodes are coming or do you just get blindsided? by Mine them? are just completely like, blindsided. Kind of just... I've been really lucky where it's not been the ones where I'm up for three days straight driving in circles and, you know, having one of those yeah. manic episodes. Oof. I, I'm lucky I haven't gotten to that stage, but there was a point in our, our relationship where he was like, I feel like you're just angry all the time. Yeah. And I was like, I'm not an angry person. I'm not angry at you. Like, I know this is what the mania is. You know, this is the explosion that I'm having. So, you know, when I first met him, we've been together for about seven years now, but when I first met him, I had been through a really bad relationship prior to that in yeah, which, yeah, and it never helps, <laughs> which caused my, my mania of course, to go crazy, you know, and go off the spectrum. But to be honest, you know, I was very open and honest about being bipolar and, and living with this illness. I was getting cheated on left and right and all these problems, but it was always my fault because I was bipolar. And it was like, oh, well, you're the crazy one, right? So there was a stigma of me being like, why would I ever share with anyone what's going on? Because when I've done nothing wrong in the relationship, it's being pointed on my fault because of something I was born with. You wouldn't say like, oh, oh, you know, I cheated on you because you have cancer. I cheated yeah. on you because you have diabetes. You know, I mean, these no. are like things that happen. Yeah. So when I first met my husband, I had been single for about a year and a half and I had made a pact that I was like, you know, the next person I, I share this with, I'm going to say it in the first sentence because I want them to know like, this is me. And like, you either accept it for what it is. Let me move on. Like, let's not get attached. So that was like the second sentence out of my mouth was I'm bipolar like you can either live with it and deal with it and he's like okay cool like that's, li no big that's deal. like kind of it's liberating yeah I think I was just so sense, exhausted you know I was exhausted yeah, I was exhausted like, so tired it's almost like you are like living with the secret though like even with my fiance now like I was so embarrassed to tell her yeah because I was like she's gonna think I'm fucking crazy of course of course. You know, and she's going to be like, you know, and then, you know. When it's, was the moment that you told stuff. her? We were in bed together and I was like, listen, I have to tell you something, which guys. But don't how ever far say into that. the relationship? I would say about four or five months. Okay. Oh, wow. Wow. Yeah. Four or five months. Because if you think like uh, it was still relatively new. new for me, you. Of like, course. Ha having a diagnosis. So I'm going through all the stuff in my head. I'm like, oh, am I fucking like crazy now? Like yeah. what's going on? You know, right. when you hear bipolar from a, from a mental health professional, the first thing in my head was, okay, this explains a lot. Did you feel relieved? Because I felt such relief. I felt a huge amount of relief. Yeah. And then I was like, all right, but what do we do to fix it? Because like, I feel like shit right now. Yeah. I was like, I was so liberated to find out what was going on with me but what's the because, solution yeah because i went through everything that just shows you how much we don't think about mental health right because i'm thinking i'm having a heart attack my lung is collapsing yeah. not one part of me was like oh, like, oh i should right. probably just go see somebody and get checked out for yeah. my dome skin yeah yeah you know what yeah. i mean yeah. like yeah. And, you know let's just figure all of this out when i found it out it was a huge sense of relief but then into my uh brain goes how do I tell everybody this now? In the Being somebody that has a yeah. social media audience and has a following and, you know, I was on a, a very popular podcast at the time. And for me to actually go through it, because when you're doing weekly shows, people are like, all right, where the fuck is Danny? Right. Like, what's right. going on? Right. Where is he? Right. And I had to kind of explain. It was kind of a beautiful thing because I was able to let so many people know at once. Right. And I don't take that experience for granted because there's so many people that don't have that opportunity yeah, right. to have that pouring out of, uh, of experience, but also that pouring in of support that I had. Of course, from, yeah. From fans of the show and, and all of that. But then when all the lights go on, you know you're an actress. You're playing a different person. You know, as much as you yeah. want to be yourself on the internet, I try to be myself as much as possible, yeah. especially when it comes to, you know, mental health discussions. But, you know, there's some things in life that cameras aren't going to be rolling and no. that was for me i had to tell my fiance who was my girlfriend at the time i said listen you have to, i have to tell you something and like i said guys it's very hard to start a sentence like that with uh with a female especially in bed <laughs> she was just like what what do you have to tell She's me like what did and you do like, uh yeah and i was yeah. like i have bipolar type too she was like oh okay and she was very understanding and how amazing is that 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 was her reaction that it was just like 
Okay, and what? You know what I mean? Cool, great. Yeah. That's the big reveal, you know? Yeah. I mean, it normalizes it so much where it just makes you feel, like love that person so much more. It really was like a huge thing for me because I am somebody who is very emotional, but I'm also, uh, I want to make everybody happy. I will put people before me all the time in right. terms of making them feel better in that moment, that instant gratification right. for them. But for me, when that happened it was a relief but as the relationship goes on you know there's some days where she'll come home and be like what's wrong with you what's going on right. and i don't even know that it's happening yeah those and i have very, that too it, right you know and i feel like such an like an asshole in right. those moments it's hard for me to just be like this is just who i am like this is what part is it of that my she life. sees like does she see like i'm curious with the part like type two is it more yeah. of like she sees a depression? Does she see like an anxiety or like an anger? Like what is the emotion that you feel that she can identify that that something's off? So I'm very convinced that she was like some kind of like witch in a former life. I love or that. Like some kind of, or some kind I was of like totally a witch in a former life. I love witches. <laughs> like, yeah, like a fortune teller yeah. in a former yeah. life or something. She, knows she was like too a much. like a gypsy or something. Yeah. <laughs> so like she could read my energy within three seconds wow. of where I'm at. I'm a very embracing lover, like huggy, kissy, you touchy feely. Yeah, yeah, yeah. You know, touchy feely. You know, and when that stuff is a little bit somewhat off, she could tell immediately that there's something going on right. because my By your entire actions. mood is down. And my entire mood is very robotic. So mm. it'll be like, did you take the dog out? The dog needs to eat. Did you run the dishwasher? Okay. So it becomes like very robotic. Monotone, Ro I call right. them like robotic lows. Yeah. Where I'm just kind of like, okay, all right. And is it because fine. you miss your medication? Like, is it because, or it's just still, even with the medication, you still have these it's, moments? The lows that I have now... I will take any day of the week. The lows before my medication. Oof, debilitating. Um, just debilitating, like never leaving the house, yeah. never wanting to do anything, no productivity whatsoever. Didn't care about how I looked, how I dressed, showering. Like it's really, really fucking right. bad. It's almost like you're just waiting to die. Right, right. In a, right, in a, right. in a yep. weird sense. It's you're like, like one in day, limbo. Like, you know. Yeah. Yeah, it's a super emo. Yeah. You know what I mean? Yeah. So, and I live my life so much in front of a camera and so much online and all this presence that for me, when the lows were so low, I couldn't even do that. So I couldn't even entertain. So now you take that out of the equation. I'm not entertaining anyone. I'm not entertaining myself. I'm feeling like shit. Those lows of those lows where I just, like I said, like, I don't even want to be here anymore. Right. Like right. this is I can't like do a this. wrap for me. Yeah. Nah, fuck this. So now with my medications, you guys don't take lithium, right? I don't take lithium. I take something called Lamictal, but lithium okay. is something that was an option for me, but I reacted really well to Lamictal, but so it's a I mood take, stabilizer. Yeah, yeah. So I take a mood stabilizer too. I'm like an iPhone battery at this point. Yeah, you can yeah. just plug me in. You know what I yeah, mean? Like yeah. you need a charge, just put it in my mouth. Like I'll charge you up. We're good. good. We're good. Yeah, we're good. <laughs> so once I started a mood stabilizer, it just made my lows like normal lows. Right. Like, you know I'm just I mean? having like, a bad day, fully, you know? Yeah. Just like, you know, like, uh, sure. I'm not all there today, but like, I could still be function, like sure. functioning and have these things. Like, my thing was I needed to get functional. Right. Right. Especially as a comedian. It's like, dude, like most of my content's like poopy. You know what I yeah, mean? Like, like silly I rap stuff. About, right. Yeah. I rap about titties and shit. Yeah. Like, you know what I mean? Sure, like, sure. That's just my, that's my life. But I need to be in a good mental health space to be able to even do that. Cause you're, did you ever do stand up and, and do on stage performing? Yeah. I've done it. So here's another story too. So I went to my new physician cause my insurance switched. Oh, uh, the worst, sure right? When it, before. it's the fucking mine worst. just switched. It's the worst. And you're like, how do I get medicine again? Yeah. Money. I need to go just to take this. it all. Yeah. Oh, you know, it's what's my copay now? It's yep. almost like you got to get hit by a bus to like for them to even cover it. Yep. <laughs> exactly. You know what I mean? It's like I'm just going to jump in front of a train. So no I can one takes there. No one. No one accepts therapy either. That's my favorite. No. They're like, no. they're like, that's oh, not a real sucks? thing. OK, they're like, oh, your brain sucks. OK, that's four thousand cool. dollars. Thank you so much. It's the worst because there should be and I'll get back to my story, but there should be like a mental health union. 
Like you know how there's like sad. SAG? Yeah. There should be it should be called sad. Sad. The sad union. <laughs> oh my god, yes. I love that. Yeah. Uh, sign me up. I will we become should. president. We will be we'll start a mental health union where everyone just pays a little bit every month so we yeah. can all get coverage for yeah. therapy. Yeah, I love that. I love that. We just came up with a billion dollar idea on here. Listen, do not take it. We are copywriting it right here yeah. on your podcast. Like end of story. <laughs> so like get back to my other story. I have a new physician. I had to go through the whole fucking thing. First of all, a lot of people don't understand too. When you go to get like controlled substances and st- stuff, yeah. everybody looks at you like kind of like all right is this guy a fucking drug addict or like what's going on i mean they you, look at you like that when oh you mean me when i twisted my ankle and i went to urgent care and they had to ask me what medicine i was on and i was like i'm on lamictal and they stopped and they closed their computer and they go we just have a few questions to ask you are you feeling suicidal today and i was like oh uh, what i literally just twisted my ankle like what are you talking about and it's I hate like that question so much i'm like no i'm actually feeling like amazing but i'm in pain but i don't even want yeah. pain medicine i just want to know if you can ice this up like thanks like yeah it's just, it's just the weirdest thing it's like i remember i had to go get a dental cleaning and they were like oh you're on like lexapro they're like how you feeling today i was like dude just clean my fucking teeth all right just make me make these 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 bright and white, okay? Yeah, Thank right. you. You're not even a real doctor, man. You're yeah, a you're a dentist. Don't tell me about my brain. DDS. No, but no. So like, my physician was like, every comedian I have is depressed. What? Which was kind of crazy of her to say. And yeah, yes, goes, I mean that's every, a fact. Goes, but like, I, still, <laughs> she says every comedian I have that comes in here is depressed. What's up with you guys? And I fucking started cracking up. What's up with I, you guys? Because I was so offended. I just thought it was so funny to hear a doctor say that at the same time. You're like, what's but up then, with me? That, a lot, actually. Goes, yeah, and he was like, what's up with you guys? I was like, I don't know. I was like, listen, 20 milligrams of Lexapro. Thank you. So we're having the conversation, and I've always come back to, and maybe you can attest to this, too, because I want to yeah. see what it was like for you. If I wasn't, like, bipolar, I don't think I would be as kind of awesome as i am to be honest 100 percent. i've always been an attention seeker Uh i was a class clown i Uh had to do all these things i did act out i would have outbursts and you know a lot of it was chalked up to like being a kid but then once you get diagnosed i'm sure a lot of this started to make sense for you everything when you're acting (laughs) when you're acting and having like a manic episode on set i'm sure the people that you work with are like Oh, this person's like a fucking diva now. Well, what's interesting is, is it's funny you say that. I've actually never had a manic episode on set. So that's your safe space, huh? It's, it's my safe space. And, you know, the one time that I had before I was diagnosed with bipolar disorder, the one time that I had an, in quote, out of quote, what I would call an episode, but it wasn't a manic episode. I was having my first panic attack, like you were having, where my grandma had just had a stroke a week before, and I had convinced myself that I was having a stroke. I had a migraine. My body was numb. I couldn't talk. I couldn't swallow. I couldn't say my lines. And no one knew that I was having this on set because I was, when I was first getting ready, like in the makeup trailer. And so, you know, the makeup and hair girls knew what was going on and they were so supportive and so loving, but they had a set doctor that came and he was like, uh, you know, I have to tell you like a lot of actors go through this and they have this and what you're having is what we call a panic attack. It's a little anxiety and, you know, we can give you a beta blocker and like calm your heart rate. That's all it is. And I was like, no, sir, you don't understand. Like, this is what's wrong with me. And he's like, I promise you. And he was really lovely and, and calmed me down. Right. He, but like, that the professional, like, you don't know what you're talking about. Laugh. Yeah. Like, no, but he yeah. was like, very, he's like, <laughs> yeah, he's like yeah, yeah. ah, no, but he's like, gotta be good. And it was so reassuring because I had never had someone one that made me feel so comfortable, like from a doctor point of view. And because I had been screwed over by so many uh, psychiatrists and all kinds of doctors. And actually when I was diagnosed, I had gone back, I was shooting in Canada. I came back to LA and I had gone to my uh, acupuncturist and my acupuncturist, I was explaining some symptoms that I had had. And he said, has anyone ever told you that you could live with bipolar disorder? And I was like, what? And he's like, all of the actors that I work with, they all seem to have this, you know, and your symptoms are just like right there. And I went to a new psychiatrist and I said, Hey, someone said I could be living with bipolar disorder. He's like, that's absolutely what your symptoms are. I was like, wow. what? 
like a series of events, but I am very lucky where I don't know if it's a safe space or my mind tricks myself, you know, into being happy, but I have yet to have a manic episode on set because I think I'm just escaping into a different reality. My brain just shuts off yeah. that part. Thank God or whoever you're into. But I think it would be different if I, I was. I a, yeah, I know. But honestly, but I think it would be different because like I look at someone like Kanye West. Right. And that's right. like a, a total extreme of like everyone's using him as an example now. So I'm using him as an example now. But like the difference right. is like, yes, he's playing a character of himself. Like when he goes off and does his, you know, yay, you know, music music and all that stuff and like yeah. dresses up and has the mask and all that stuff. But at the end of the day, like when he's writing things like that's his own writing, that's his own craft, that's his own art. So I can understand if there's a manic episode that comes from that. For me, like I think that my mind is tricked because I'm playing a completely different human being and yeah, it's so not my was, art. Right. So what was your first acting gig at nine? I actually was in a movie called Lost and Found. I did a small role with David Spade. Oh, wait, that's a David Spade and the dog. <laughs> yes. I, I love that movie. I had one line uh, or two lines and I called David Spade a pussy and it was the best moment of my life. And my mother had to explain what a pussy was, why I had to say it was such an infliction. That was me. Yeah, basketball. Yeah, I remember that movie. I forgot who the actress is that whose dog A French is. actress. She was great. She was so hot when I was a Gorgeous. kid. Gorgeous. So I was just like, oh yeah, I like this movie. Yeah. And then it ends like that. I remember the end is like at a party or something. Yeah. And then he like comes. Yeah, yeah. Good music. I haven't thought about that. I'm going to watch that movie. Now. <laughs> yeah, I'm the girl playing basketball with David Spade. I haven't seen that movie in years. Have yeah. you ever seen David Spade recently? And you should be like, hey, you know, I called you a pussy. When it's I was my nine. dream to see him or like be on his You'll show of him. his and then be like, because I've seen him out and about. And like, I know a lot of comedians that do stand up with him. And they're always like, yeah. oh, come come meet David, you know, like, come meet Spade. And I'm like, I don't know. I, I'm, like, so nervous. But I always want to like go up to him and be like, already. I want to be like, do you remember me? I called you a pussy when I was nine. <laughs> but that's, like, kind of, that's a big star in 1999. Like, were you even intimidated at all? I was not intimidated. I was obsessed. I loved You were obsessed. Well, the love of my life, I always tell my husband, I say, I'm so sorry. If he was alive, I'd be with him, is is Chris Farley. That oh, was. He, does. he yeah. doesn't. Yeah, that's the love of my life so for me like tommy boy for me snl like everything was billy madison oh yeah driver the best i mean he was he's everything and more and so for me like he and spade just had this connection that was the chemistry was undeniable like their friendship it was beautiful so your dream came true at nine now you're just playing with house money now i'm just playing with house money yeah, exactly. <laughs> so nine, you call Spade a pussy. Awesome. Yes. Love that. Yes. Now, after that, when was your next gig after nine? Oh, my God. I did so many. I was like a guest star on ER. I was guest star on this show, on that show. Like, I constantly was working. But then when I was in middle school, I wanted to go back to school and have like a, in quote, unquote, real life you know, job, right, right. Uh, like a real life life. And what so, is real life? And what is real life? So I still auditioned and I still worked here and there, but I really committed to being a kid. And I did that till I was about a sophomore in high school in which I got a, a TV show, a pilot, and it brought me to Australia. And I left school after that. I was like, I'm going to graduate, get my high school proficiency, start doing my junior college classes online, but I want to be an actress. Right. And so I went back and did that. When were the initial signs for you? Because, you know, when we're young, we, we kind of have a memory, but like, we're like, oh, yeah, it's spotty. You know what I mean? Right. At what age did you really start to kind of have an idea that maybe something was a little bit? 15. So, so like sophomore year of high school. For sure. A little before. So, yeah, right. a little because before. Even at that time, it's like, oh, like, you know, you're a teenager. Like, you're, you're like, oh, it's like hormones. Puberty. Yeah. Right. They always blame hormones. So around 15 is when you started to notice. Yeah, I was really, I, I would just, yeah. And that's when they put me on antidepressants, which made me suicidal, you know. Yeah, um, and then it kind of disappeared. Um, for some reason, it did, like when I was 19. Um, and then it started showing up again when I was about 21, 22. And that's when it really okay. started flaring up. And that's when I had the panic attack for the first time. And the doctor, you know, prescribed me bipolar medicine and it changed my life. Because even like for me, like the, there are the times where it goes away and you're like, oh, my God, I beat it. Yeah. 
Yeah. And then and then it's like, hold on a second. G- give me a year and then I'm going to come back gonna to you and I'm going to fuck your life up. You think this <laughs> is bad? Like, oh, no, 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 no. You have all these amazing things going on. You're happy in Guess love. Guess what? They're all going to stop me. Yeah. You're happy in love. You're making money and you have a job. Have fun. It's going away real that soon. That was the other thing, too, is financially, I was doing the best I've ever done in my life. I was in good shape. You know, I was just living a good life. And yeah. then my brain was just like, hold on a second. It's Your too life good to be true. It's going to be terrible now. Yeah. yeah. What is that about? I mean, God, I wish I knew. <laughs> I have nothing to complain about, but I can't poop or pee by myself. I can't do anything. I'm like, I literally was debilitatedly like in a ball. When you have the bouts with depression and then also like the the manic highs. Yeah. I always ask my type one homies, if you had to pick one to have, which one do you flourish more in? The highs are the best things in the entire world. It's the best feeling. I've yet to get one low, but I love to hear people talk about the the Are you kidding me? Like the highs are the best. Like I like full disclosure, I've never done cocaine before, but whenever I talk to other people who live with bipolar one disorder, they're like, This is what cocaine does to people. (laughs) It's like a false ego. Where you're like, everything is perfect. Come at me, bro. I'm hot Look shit. At this flower. Try me. Like, I was like that sassy girl that was like, oh, I will mess you up if you, like, come at me. Yeah, yeah. You know what I mean? Like, try me. Like, I, I'm going to have fun with you right now, you know? And now I look back and I was like, what the fuck uh, was wrong awesome. with me? <laughs> All my type friends, they've always told me, like, you'll know. And I'm like, oh, yeah. Okay. And then I'm like, oh, shit. Yeah, I know. Do you have a lot of friends that lived with bipolar disorder? I have three that I know, like, personally. Wow. And then I have others that I've met, like, through the industry and stuff. Right. So, like, you know, I had friends that I grew up with that were, I have one friend who was severely bipolar. Mm. Like, from a very young age, his parents knew about it. He was right. medicated. Like, we were just hanging out one day playing computer games. Uh-huh. And just, like, in the middle, he, like, entirely switched up and, like, shattered his entire, like, computer setup. So, like, he would have these very, uh, like, manic yeah, outbursts. That. Yeah. Yeah. So that was kind of my first exposure to it. I've always been relatively sensitive to mental health issues because as a kid i felt like i'm one of five children so i felt that i didn't really get a lot of attention right. growing up right which right. Uh, definitely caused me to act out and show yeah, out and, and try to fight for my space of sure. love yeah. me yeah it's you all about I mean? me yeah i'm yeah. here Look at me mommy yeah yeah and that's kind of like what led me to comedy though is because a lot of the times i did kind of have to entertain myself uh with like my i have one brother who's close to me my brother michael in age so, you know, we had to, like, entertain ourselves a lot. My brother yeah. had a kid when he was 16. Automatically, a lot of that attention goes to the baby. Right. And, you know, I was changing diapers at eight. Wow. You know? I could change a diaper. Yeah, I could change a diaper with my eyes closed now. Oh, my. You're, so you're ready for a baby. <laughs> yeah, yeah, for sure. 100%. If my fiance would let me get her pregnant today, I would do it. But she's, but she's not like, ready yet. She's like, we need to be married first. <laughs> She was like, I need to look good. I need to look good at the wedding. Yes. Okay. Okay. So get on it. So get the wedding going. Yes. We are. Her sister's getting married uh, in a couple of weeks. So once that's done, we'll we'll get into overdrive ourselves. Yeah, it'll be our turn. I was exposed to it at a young age with a close friend of mine. Didn't really realize how serious it was until obviously I got a little bit older and had like a better grasp on the world. But when I was young, I just felt like I didn't have the proper attention that I was just longing for. And it really actually made me have harsh feelings towards my parents. Huh. Um, Interesting. And for a long time. But when I was going through uh, my pre-diagnosis, my, my episodes, my father and my mother and I got very, very close. I moved in with them. I stayed there. They really, like, nursed me. Oh, damn, I could cry right now. They That's nursed so me, like, back to health. And our relationship actually really mended during that time because my father slept in the same bed as me for a week. He made sure I ate. He drove me to all my doctors. My mom found me a therapist. She helped me get insurance. I really rekindled a a relationship with my parents that I was longing for my entire life. Right. And you had no idea. Right. 
Right. And I had no idea, you know, and there, there was a lot of wow. disdain that I held against them because, uh, what I was going through, I felt like they owed me something. You know what I mean? Right, in, a, right. in a selfish, sure. you know, I'm, I was like, you owe me attention. You owe me this. And to see how they dropped their entire lives for a 30 year old man to treat me with the most tender love and care, it was unbelievable. I, I started. I started to realize they had a lot on their plate. Right, right. I mean, you know, that's they, that's they the other it. thing that you have to, you know, acknowledge, and you are acknowledging, but, but in general, like, we have to acknowledge the people that are around us that do give up so much in sacrifice for us, you know, how lucky that is and how rare that is because it doesn't happen a lot. Yeah, so. and, 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 and I always try to say it on this is, a support system, whether it's your in like your actual, you know, your family is an amazing thing, but not everybody has that. So yeah. I always try to say though, you have to try and find a support system. This is really not something you could do on your own, struggling with something like uh such as bipolar, type one or type two, no. even panic disorder. It's something that I'm so blessed that I was able to have, even though I was in so much pain. Yeah. Yeah. I wouldn't trade that week for anything because there was just so much love and and I really knew where I stood with my parents. Yeah, of course. Because I felt unloved as a kid growing up. Aww, you know what I mean? Right. So I was able to have that. And, and you had that moment. It was just a beautiful thing oh, that was coming that. from such a horrible situation. So what I wanted to uh, switch that over to <laughs> is with your parents, with your yeah. mother. Yeah. Right? Yeah. Tell me what it's like to have... This is what I want to do. And was your mom just like, listen, if we're going to do this, you got to go 100%. What were your mom's sacrifices for you Oh, in I terms mean, of uh, your career and just life in general? I mean, it was all her sacrifice. Like, you know, she stopped working yeah. because she wanted to be a mom and take care of me. And it worked out for the best because then I started doing my acting and all that stuff. Um, so it was, you know... Her driving me to auditions all day long, you know, running around, doing the errands, going over the lines with me, whatever I needed, finding the resources that I needed. I was very lucky. Ago. Yeah. Moms are the best, especially my mom. She's the coolest. Everyone loves yeah. her. And I was just really lucky, but it was never felt like a pressure to perform. It was like, if right. you want to do this, you do this. But if you don't, we don't have to do this. There's there's ways out. I remember even one time, like, I was going to start going to a, a normal school again. And we had signed up and we had put the down payment for the tuition and all this stuff. And I was like, I don't want, I'm not ready yet. I want to still homeschool. I wasn't ready yet. And she was like, right. okay, it's your decision, you know. Yeah, you your know. mom sounds dope. Yeah, she's fine. <laughs> she's cool. Tell me what it's like memorizing lines with bipolar type 1. Easy. I don't know. Is it easy? I don't know. I don't do you, know any do you, different. Do you feel like you're obsessive though sometimes? Yes. When it comes no. to work or just in life? No, I don't feel the obsessiveness of things like that. I think maybe in my real life, I have obsessive compulsive disorder, but I don't think yeah. when it comes to the lines and stuff, because it's so second nature to me at this point that I, it's just what you do. You just learn your lines. All right, so listen, I played Biff in Death of a Salesman. Uh, oh, my God, amazing. Amazing. In seventh, in seventh grade. Wow, um, what a star. Yeah, so, you know, I'm kind of a big deal. So what I wanted to say is I really commend people that can memorize lines. Yeah. And also be able to act them out. It was so difficult for me. But it's just um, muscle memory. Like, I think once yeah, you my, do I it. The retention rate of the goldfish. I know, but you say that, but I think that if you did it over a certain amount of years and you did it every single day, I think that it would be different. It becomes muscle memory at that point, especially when you're doing sitcoms because, you know, you'll be in front of a live audience, you do your joke. Like this happened, you know, a lot on Big Bang Theory where it, the joke didn't land and it wasn't funny. Right. So the writers would immediately stand, you know, in like a huddle and they would rewrite the lines and they would show you on the palm of their hand sometimes like, hey, here's the line. Oh, Memorize it. And you have to look it over once, blah, blah, blah. Okay, got it. You know, and then perform it. So it becomes That's muscle memory outrageous. at that point. So there's two things that I've always wanted to do. I did take acting in a uh, community college as well. Cool. Uh, no big deal. Superstar yeah, over here. Uh, Danny. Yeah. So I played Biff. That's my main role. Also, I uh, was an elf 
in a Christmas show. Oh, wow. Um, in third grade. Yeah. Cute. That was, I shined. I shined. Cute. In acting, I actually got in my acting class in college, I was actually able to do a monologue and it was terrifying. It was like 10 minutes long. That's a big deal. That was like my first time, like fully memorizing like something and acting it out for that long. And it was so difficult for me, but it went really, really well. Oh, um, good. It went really, really well. So I've always had an admiration for actors being able to memorize lines, but not only just memorize them, be able to act them out. Right. right. Um, it's, it's, a, it's a real talent. It's a skill. It's a skill for sure. Yeah. It's like learning a language. Yeah, it is. It's like, hey, learn, learn this language in like a week. But I think it helps when you're younger, just doing it all the time. That's true. See, whenever I have kids, though, I'm going to be like, teach it French. Yes, you say that, but I feel like, do you speak French? No. No, but I'm just going to hire people. I just want to be like, hey, I want you to come talk to my kid in French for an hour. But the yeah. problem is, like, my one of my first languages was French because I had a... Oh, you speak French? I used to. This is my point. I had a French au pair, and she would only speak French to me. And I was fluent in French. And then she had to go away. And I got older, and I had no one to speak French with. So then I lost it all. Um, so have you tried to pick it back up? A little bit here and there. If I picked you up and threw you to Paris, could you speak? I took Latin in high school, so I can read things very well. Oh, you're one of those guys, huh? Yeah. So I can yeah. read. Were you in advanced English? No, 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 no. English was not my strong suit. No, no, no. Math and, math and science. So did you take advanced math and science? Yeah, I was two years ahead of math and um, a year oh, ahead damn. in science, and I did AP classes. Yeah, no, math is always something in school that was so easy for me. I was a freshman taking junior classes. I'm so, I'm so jealous. Mm -hmm. How do you get that smart acting at nine, and then also, <laughs> were you homeschooled before that? So I was homeschooled for a little bit. Yeah, you know, it's genetics. My family yeah, are all genius. mathematic geniuses and all in computer technology. And I came out singing and dancing. So I came out completely <laughs> upset from them. So they were like, we want you to be an engineer. And I was like, what do you mean? Like, what does that mean? Like, they were like, computer no, engineer? No. Like, no. You I'm going to call David Spade a pussy. Yeah, I'm going to do that's, this. That's gonna they were like, you're going to go to MIT. I'm like, no, I'm not going to go to school. <laughs> I'm going to the living room. Yeah. Okay. Like and that's what's happening. <laughs> <laughs> that's it. That's it. I don't go beyond the living room and to set. That's it. Bitch. We're that's done. What I do. We're done. So have you, as you gotten older in the industry, growing up in the industry, especially struggling with bipolar type one, do you think that it's helped you as like an artist? Where do you think it helps you? Where do you think it's actually made you uh, better? in a sense and what are some of the things that like you're trying to work on the older you get with it well i don't know if it made me better because i don't know any different you know like right. i don't know what it would be like if i didn't have it or if i wasn't medicated or if i was medicated at a time so i'm not sure if that's an answer i wouldn't know because it's just what if coulda woulda shoulda circumstances yeah, you know sure. but there are definitely things that i want to improve on you know i'm a firm believer in you know therapy and working on yourself and not just traditional therapy but whatever that therapy means to you if that means meditation if that means going and taking a dance class if that means going outside and just running around the block i don't know like writing you know whatever it is for you i think that this listening to your mind and and taking a moment to just pause is is really important and it's necessary and it, you'll never be done not doing that let's talk about your podcast right what are your goals for the next couple of years in terms of you know mental health awareness and uh spreading your message and also you know why should people listen to emotional support well, they should listen because it's fucking funny. And I think that the reason why, you know, I started this podcast is I was really sick of hearing people talk about mental health in such a depressing, like, draining way where oh, it was like, worse. oh, my gosh. And, you know, my icon and idol and favorite person of all time is Howard Stern. And so for me, like, I'd love uh, that. I grew up listening to that. My mom was pregnant listening to Howard Stern. I don't know any different. I got oh, to host gosh. the wrap up show with them. Like, I've had so much fun and that kind of energy and the rawness and, and, that's what I wanted to bring. So if you like want to come and hear swear words and hear us talk about like real truth of mental health and try to make it funny, like that's what it is. There is levity in it. 
You, you there have has to, to have levity. There has in to be. Health. If there's not, then what's the point? You have to. Yeah. Like, if I can't laugh at like a manic episode I've had before, like no. it's not. It's not worth it. No, and it's all about for me. Like my goal is just to share stories, share my stories, share other people's stories, and like maybe that will help one person out in the interweb. You know what I mean? That's all it's about. Three quick questions that I always ask at sure. the end of every show. Sure. And then we will get you out of here. First question was, are you happy? Yeah. I am. Perfectly simple. <laughs> Are you happy today? Two, what is something, a goal that you have, whether short-term or long-term, something that you really want to accomplish, whether it be short-term or long-term, what's one of the main goals that you have right now? It would it'd be professional, personal, whatever. Yeah. Uh, creating a community for uh, mental health, a community that people can just check in whenever they want. You got sad, baby. We got sad coming. We got, we got sad. sad coming. We're starting to press a depression union. Like it's happening. That's it. And three, do you want kids? Oh yeah, of course. Yeah. How many? Because you're an only child. That's the reason I asked. Oh, I don't know. I feel like let's start with one. Do you want more than one? I don't you, know. You just want one? You want to do it? I just feel like maybe start with one and go from there and see what the universe provides me. Boy or girl? Boy or girl, if you had a shot. Probably girl, but honestly, for me, I'm a very big superstitious person. And, like, I'm, like, not super religious, but I'm superstitious. And I say, uh, as long as it's a healthy I'm baby. Like, I always say that, too. Ten fingers, ten toes, and look like their mom. Yeah. Yeah. As long as they look like me. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Although my husband's very handsome, so people would probably be like, no, you want him to look like him. <laughs> Yeah, no, no. Listen, listen. I always say the same thing. I'll take whatever I can get. Just listen, healthy. And as long as it's like, a healthy child, I think that's the most important thing, and people forget that. Yeah, for sure. I yeah. want a boy, though. Yeah, I'm sure. I'm sure. <laughs> guys want guys, you know. Guys want guys, but here's the thing: when you you'll want probably guys, have five girls. Have, I'm always gonna have girls. Yeah. My dad had three boys. My uncle had three boys, and then my other uncle had three girls. Yeah, you're gonna have five girls. I'm going to have five girls. Yeah. But here's the thing about boys, though. You say you want a boy, but then there's that weird machismo thing uh, where it's yeah. like head of the house. And then, like, you're going to blame me for everything when you're 16. Like, uh, I feel like dads and daughters, are they click better. Yeah, they're cuter. <laughs> What's your favorite genre to perform? Oh, I think comedy. It's always fun. Comedies. Drama, I feel like it takes, like, do you ever take your your work home with you when you do, like, dramatic scenes? No, you have to leave it there. See, I never understood, like, the Daniel day Lewis's of the world who has to, like, be Abraham Lincoln all day. It's like, dude, like, what are we doing? Hey, to each its own. That's what I always say. See, that's spoken like a true <laughs> in the industry person right there. <laughs> Like, I always think of method acting, and it's like, all right, like, that's cool, but, like, you know, like, why are we sending, like, Will Smith, like, dead rats in the mail and shit? Like, you know, like, like, like what are we doing? I know there's art. The world, yeah. art exists in yeah. the world. Yeah. I get it. Yeah. But don't ruin my day. Yeah. With yeah. your art. Yeah. You know yeah. what I'm saying? To each its own. Like, when, I, to each its own. Have you ever worked, you don't have to say their name. Okay. Obviously, you don't. Have you ever worked with somebody that stayed in character all the time? Yeah. How fucking weird is that? To each his own. <laughs> I got to try. I got to try. <laughs> Listen, Alessandra, it's been amazing. Thank I know you, you got to so come much. on I my mean, show I, next. 100%. I feel like we could have talked for three hours, I know. but I'm going to have you on again and I'll do yours. And then we'll, oh, I would we'll love get that. Like really, really, oh, really, I would really love deep that. into it. First of all, where can everybody find you on the internet? And yeah. then uh, also stuff that you have upcoming, do all oh, the plugs. Yeah. Cool. So yeah. Everybody can find out. My name's very complicated. It's Alessandra Torresani. But if you search Alessandra Torresani in and some form of whatever, even if it's Tortellini is the last name, it'll come up on my Instagram. You can find me there. And then you can find me, um, follow Emotional Support. Uh, that's the name of the podcast. And it's spelt like emotional. So you can find it at emotional support pod.com, at emotional support pod on Instagram. And just be sure to give a subscribe, a like, a review, leave a comment, and don't be an asshole with mean comments. <laughs> Try to be nice. Yeah, we got we have enough problems. All right, like, we have enough problems. I, I, okay, I my God. My thing is though is I'll fucking turn up on somebody though. See, I used to do that, but now I'm I'm too tired. 
oh i fucking live for it yeah i thrive in it like, I, I'll, I'll go and comment on their pictures and like tag their friends in it i do weird shit you do that but then it gets old because like for me it happens at least once a week it's now gotten to the point where i'm just like if i acknowledge them that's what they want they want the energy I know, but it's just it's the Italian. I know. Makes me I know. Just, Fighter. I got to fire off. I got to fire Fighter. off. Um, Fighter. Alessandra Corisani. Yay. Oh, I love the echo. That's so fun. You got it. Thank you so much for coming on the show. Thank uh, you so I appreciate much. it. And uh, like I said, go check out Emotional Support. Woohoo. Uh, like, subscribe, smash all those buttons. I'll put all the descriptions here. Thank you so much for your time. Oh. I appreciate it. Have a wonderful, wonderful day and a yeah. wonderful rest of your week. And uh, I'll reach out and we'll set up a time and I'll I come know. on your show. Literally, thank you so much. I would love that. Anytime.